I'm glad you're uh, coming around. How, how are you doing? Uh, anxiety attacks, no sleep, depression, hitting all the cliches. Sometimes it just feels like you're getting lost up there. Everything's gonna be okay. <sighs> Miss Andrews, are you okay? Definitely not. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Empty Space edition of the Bomb Squad. Yes, we're still doing this. Yes, I will never stop until every person has rented my movie, The Empty Space. You saw the trailer. It's not going to end. Just go watch it. If you send me a receipt, I'll give it a break for a week. But welcome to the Bomb Squad. We have another guest on today. We have Danny Tarango, who did the music for The Empty Space. Hey, Danny, how's it going? Pretty good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so tell us, well, we worked on The Empty Space, but first, will you tell us a little bit about, I guess, what you do and then how you kind of, how we came to work on this on this film of ours? Um, well, I do the, the scores for some of your projects. Um, I think this was the first uh, one that you came to me for, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, because I know we did some of the short films, but that was afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you had heard a couple of my ideas. And then when you did, you're like, well, we want to try uh, doing a couple of tracks for these scenes. And then I think it just took off from there. Yeah, because I, I I mean, Danny's been a musician forever. And I knew he was a musician, but I, it was like more in a band. And so we had kind mm -hmm. of worked. Um, I mean, I had heard his music, but I didn't like, I don't know how it translates. But I asked him like, hey, do you want to try, try this out? And like me and Danny have a lot of the same ideas for like what we like for musical scores and so that really worked together and we had William working in uh, in Austin but there was like we needed more tracks and I felt like you know it's the thing where right now we're independent and we're able to use two composers and have them work on different things and it just kind of worked out that way and we we're able to to put it together and then we worked on um, the short films because we needed well on the Freddy one I needed one that was like exactly like freddy but without us getting sued <laughs> exactly yeah that was probably why that was the most challenging of all of them just trying yeah. to make it just barely different enough to be recognizable but not uh <laughs> no copyright infringement yeah I, yeah there's a big difference between i want it to sound like this and i need it to sound like this but we can't get sued we can't get a ticket yeah but it works well like you would almost think that it's very similar if you haven't watched the Freddy one, or even if you have, I would say go check it out and then listen to the Freddy song. It's very similar without us again. We haven't gotten sued yet. Don't pay attention to this, Robert England. But yeah, and then what, Danny, I remember like, because I would send Danny music, like I would edit these long music clips of just a bunch. It was like 2001 stuff, stuff from yeah. iRobot, stuff from uh, like Godzilla. Like I was throwing everything at them. Danny, how did you approach <laughs> The fact that I apparently don't know what music genre is, and I just do <laughs> every type of music. Yeah, I know, because you would send me stuff with like pure strings, and then some with just like pure synthesizers and no percussion. I'm like, well, okay, well, I'm not exactly sure exactly what you're going for, but I think uh, just sending me the actual clips of the movie is what helped the most, and then um, just kind of going with my influence because a lot of it like uh, we've talked about before is like uh i think we both line up on the whole john carpenter influence not just his films but his his music too and so uh kind of infusing that with um with the the scenes you were showing me i think that's when it started to line up finally but it's definitely yeah. challenging in the beginning well and actually the funny thing is our very first collaboration i don't know if you remember this mm -hmm. but before we did anything, once I finished, I think we were ready to start shooting 
and I just needed a um, a little track to just announce that we were about to start shooting or announce that we were like going to start pre-pro. And so I went out to Danny and I reached out to him because I had worked with William and I liked working with William, but like I wanted also to reach out to Danny because we're family. And so I wanted to see if he, like, you know, like I said, I don't know if someone asked me to like direct a fucking animation, I'd be like, all right, but I'm going to need a lot of, <laughs> I need a lot of steps to figure out how to do this. You know, it's not, it's not one-to-one, right. but you did such a good job. And I think we ended up using that in the film and I used it a couple of different times for announcements and stuff. It was a cool track. Yeah, I, I remember. I wow. think, I don't think we ended up using it in the film. I think I sent it back to you and I was like, Hey, we need this, but it needs to sound more like how our score is now. Cause by the time <laughs> we finished everything, it was like that sound didn't work anymore. And so, but we yeah. like ended up tweaking it. And I think it's the opening track if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was yeah. one of ended up being kind of one of the main themes, but you're right. We did have to we did have to change it a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think it's still on now. Maybe I'll try to put it up here if I if I can remember that where that clip is. Yeah. Just so you guys can hear like the very first sounds of the empty space. <laughs> um and that was super cool. And also, this is a little bit behind the scenes stuff. If you watch the party scene, Danny's in there with a whole bunch of other people. And we also <laughs> shot at his house at like two in the morning. So all that house that that uh, that flashback scene is all taking place at Danny's house. Um, yeah, I think nice that was house. my uh, acting debut. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a fun one because it was like, well, it was fun for you guys. It wasn't fun for me. It was my hardest uh, day, yeah. but it was fun at that part because that's like the party part where everyone was just hanging out and like having an actual party, and I just had to film it. <laughs> but that was also our longest day because I think we had to, you know, you guys haven't seen the movie or hopefully you have. It's been a month. Um, but that, that house in particular is used throughout the film for a bunch of different things in the past and the present, um, and the future. And so we shot it all like over the course of, I think we shot it all that night and mm -hmm. there was a lot to do. Like we had to shoot the party scene. We had to shoot the aftermath of the party. We had to shoot some of the flashback scenes. We had to shoot some of the other scenes that happened later we had to shoot the entire ending there's a yeah. lot going on in that house yeah. but you know we, we we knocked it out of the park in one night I was it one night I, I know we had to come back for reshoots yeah i think the only thing you had to come back for mainly was uh one or two day shots but pretty much yeah. everything at night was that night yeah well we did have to come back for my cool super cool scene of the time lapse that uh if, again, mm. if you watch the movie, yeah. there's a part where we're showing that the party's progressing and we do a time lapse. That's just me and Danny. There's like someone who walks past. That's me. That's my cameo. <laughs> I'm like Alfred Hitchcock in terms of I don't have the crew to have enough extras. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was a lot of fun. I mean, Danny, I mean, we, Danny, you even worked on the last ones, right? Yeah, I was, uh, I guess, one of the You're grips, the technically. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think I think I have a picture of you like holding the boom mic. Everyone right. was a grip on that movie. Come on, because I, yeah. well, I know it's also like, oh, daddy, you do music here. Take the boom. You're in charge of this. <laughs> yep. You're in charge of. I didn't have that same advice of I don't know if he can do it with the grip sound. That was whoever can have it. I don't think I had that luxury at the time. <laughs> yeah. We we had the luxury of we need to get this movie done and it's ninety <laughs> degrees and it's July and our cameras overheated. As if I knew. Yeah, so, it. Yeah. Were you, I don't know, were you on the um, Borderlands or no? Borderlands, no. Yeah, I didn't get to work on that one. That was the one where I, yeah, because I know we shot it at our grandma's house and then yeah. we shot it at our uncle's house. Um, and then that was we a shot quick it, we shoot. Shot it at, yeah, that was what, Josh, five days? That was like a week, yeah. No, it was like seven days. Yeah. But Joe missed missed his flight because he was too busy getting a pizza <laughs> and so the whole first day we had to rearrange. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so Danny's kind of been there from the beginning. It's been super cool to work with him at his actual profession instead of yeah. holding grips. Um, <laughs> and yeah, what what inspired, other than me, what inspired you most for the movie? Like, where did you take your, because it's like, oh, you told me what to do. But no, what, like, kind of, <laughs> what were you looking at when you were making the music and stuff? I think I was just looking at a lot of the, well, first off, all the ideas that you sent me, because that was a, I mean, it was, it was a lot to take in, but I kind of did get an idea of what you wanted. But I think I've always been attracted to those kind of 80s kind of synth sounds. Um, I know it's been kind of making a comeback in the last, you know, five, 10 years, but um, 
but yeah, I think uh, most of it came from just watching like David Finch movies, John Converton movies. Yeah. Um, I like the scores on those ones. Blade Runner. I think the first track that I sent you that we were talking about before we even started working on the movie was something that was that was inspired by the after watching uh, I think Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really like that. I, yeah. I do remember. Yeah, I do remember. You did bring it up, and I was like, "Let's try it." <laughs> and also, um, I remember we were um, when we were like putting together some of the sounds. Like I again in a normal film, not that my film is a normal, but it, they, we do little things a little different. In normal mm -hmm. film, you hire one composer and they work on the film. With this one, we hired two composers. We had Danny and William. But the cool thing is like. I worked with both of them. I listened to the tracks isolated. If you watch the movie, I cannot tell you who's who. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if Danny can. <laughs> but like the, like the ability to match, like on both of your guys' side, to kind of match all the music so that it fits the theme. Like, I don't know how you did that, whether it was because you're following the story or you guys just knew how to work off each other. But it's it ends up being so seamless that you it's very hard to tell what's what and who's who. And I think that that, like, that's commendable. Like, I don't know if, if someone was like, hey, can you direct this, like, someone else, like Wes Anderson? I'd be like, no, I, I cannot do that. <laughs> like, it's, that seems very hard. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, when you watch the movie and if you're listening, when you watch the movie again, the first time you're going to be too scared to listen to anything. But when you watch it again, kind of pay attention to the music and be like, oh, man, I wonder who did this one and who did that one. It, there's no way to tell, but it's very interesting. I mean, I have the files I can easily look, but you know, <laughs> when you're watching it, you're you're not like looking for files. I think, I think that's super cool. I think that's, uh, I think that that's impressive, and it should be commended. Um, what yeah. do you think, Josh? What did you think of the music? It was good. <laughs> I like it was it. all right. <laughs> I feel like it, it's. I mean, it definitely like sets the tone for the movie, which is pretty important. But it's also like. To me, it's always been one of those things where if it's working well, you almost don't notice it because you're so like caught up in the scene. And I think that's like how it like feels in the empty space. So, but no, it's very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like that opening sequence when they're um, like the opening title sequence. That's like one of my favorite tracks. It just it, yeah. it completely gets you into the movie, especially now that mm -hmm. we have the new um, title sequence with, from Abby Gabbett, and it's just like you're just sucked in right away and it kind of like breaks you in. And then the last track, like I taught, we have soul parade on the, um, uh, in the movie, they're a local oh. band and they're really good. And they told me like, cause I love, I love their song. We put it in the party scene and they, um, they were like, Oh, you can put it at the end if you want. Like they're like, put it wherever you want. <laughs> yeah. And I thought about it cause I really do like that song. But to me, like that last track is so good. It's just kind of like, again, it just kind of like, it does exactly what I wanted it to do, which is it keeps the momentum going, but you know that it's over. And that's kind of like the best kind of like, I want people to be walking out of the theater or, you know, walking out of their house to go get a soda pop and be like, I'm still in the zone of this film. Like just listening to the music. And I think it does it well. I think all the music does it well. There's like the track where they're in the bookstore. And I think that that scene, like the, mm -hmm. a lot of the tracks that are, I know Danny did the track for the empty space scene. And even though I wrote that scene, I filmed that scene, I edited that scene, that scene gets to me every time. I think it's just because I put up all my anxiety woes in that speech. But the music, like the where we brought it in and where it plays, it, it elevates that scene in a way that I hadn't thought of. And so the music is great in this movie. It's super cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. But with that, we can go into our movie that's not music related at all. So we don't know theme. We don't know what themes are. But th we had Danny pick, as always. And Danny picked 1995's Judge Dredd. Um, how funny would it be, Danny, if you were like, no, that's not the one I picked. Uh, what was <laughs> that? <laughs> I kept worrying about that. I was like, oh, man, I hope it's not the Carl Urban one. <laughs> I'm watching that I'll, one. Talk about, I'll talk about that one, too. I'm ready to I mean, go. I, I love that movie, too. But I did not watch it any time in the last couple of oh, years. Oh, yeah, me neither. So it's been a while. <laughs> it's... Uh, Judge Dredd is from 1995. It's uh, directed by Danny Cannon. It's written by a whole bunch of people. It stars Sylvester Stallone. Armand Asante, who's supposed to go up against Sylvester Stallone, is Rico. Um, it stars Rob Schneider. It stars Diane Lane. 
Um, it starts a bunch. Of, oh, Max Van Schrieden shows up for some reason. That is um, not how you say his name, but <laughs> good enough, baby. <laughs> Uh, but it, it has a really great cast. Josh, since you want to be talky talky boy, <laughs> tell us what this movie is about. Um, it's about Judge Dredd, a street judge in the future of 2080, who uh, essentially gets framed for a crime he didn't commit. And it turns out it's yeah. a larger conspiracy. So, you, you know, kind of a kind of a, a sci fi romp through the future. Well, and as always, Josh missed the most important part, which is in this future, the judges are the police, they're the executioner, they are the judge. So like if you get a parking ticket, Judge Dredd will take you through the entire process, which seems a lot faster than the way we do it. But we'll talk about why that's problematic. Mm -hmm. Um, So Danny, why don't you tell us why you picked Judge Dredd? First off, I think it's appropriate for this podcast because it's definitely underappreciated critically and... I don't know about the box office, what what it, how it did. It, it made money, but not that much. I think it had like a seventy million dollar budget, and it made like a hundred and fifty million. So like it probably uh, eked past profit, and probably did uh, more back when people bought DVDs, but yeah. definitely not to the level of Stallone. Yeah. And the other reason, of course, is like when we were kids. I know you mentioned earlier we were family. Like I never had this movie on VHS. My parents never bought me like brand new VHSs. Oh, yeah. So every time I went to your house, I remember it being this like one of the movies that I would always pick out to to watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and I remember we, I saw this movie at the dollars, like when the dollars still, like when we're, when you're uh-huh. lower income in El Paso, the dollars, like a dollar every Tuesday. And so mm-hmm. we would always watch whatever movie. And so Judge Dredd was one of them. And I remember like, I can't think of a better movie to watch in the dollars than Judge Dredd because it kind of feels <laughs> like a dollar movie, you know? <laughs> but yeah, so... What did you guys think of this film? Well, I mean, I liked it a lot. Uh, I've actually, I've seen it before. So it's one yeah. of those where I was like, I was revisiting it, but my my wife had not seen it. And she'd kind of heard like, oh, it's like notoriously one of Stallone's worst movies. She's like, no, that was good. Like, you know, it's like, yeah. like it <laughs> takes you by surprise. It's funny because we actually previously on this watch Cobra, which I'd say is, a noticeably worse Stallone movie about the same thing, kind of, you know, it's like, yeah, it is, yeah. It is kind of funny. Cause in this movie, judge dread is like this, like I said, he's a police officer, but he also acts as judge jury and executioner. And that also could be described like half of the other movies where Stallone plays a cop. He does the same thing. <laughs> right. But this is like, almost like, <laughs> like this is almost a smarter version of it. I don't know. It's, it's very like satirical. Yeah. And I think that helps. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of like, uh, it does a lot of the kind of like classic, like kind of sci-fi, like world building. Like you'll hear like an ad ring, right. like recycled foods, good for the environment and okay for you. Like stuff like that. And you're yeah. like, that's a nice touch. Cause I think we're kind of headed there anyway, you know? Right. <laughs> so. right. And it's, well, and like the cool thing is the first thing that it starts off, it starts off with like showing you a bunch of comic book covers and then it starts playing the music and the music is like that kind of like big thundery, you know, epic kind of music. And like, it's just one of the best ways to open a movie. You just have like this big thundering kind mm-hmm. of looming music. And you kind of, we don't have that much in terms of score. As, like I, I, if you'd asked me to tell you what the Iron Man theme is, I could not, mm-hmm. but I can hum. I have been humming the Judge Dredd theme literally <laughs> all day. Yeah, me too. And also it's like, again, it kind of shows you where these kind of blockbusters were. And I know we talk about this all the time, but like, so the, the movie opens and it's Rob Schneider. He's playing an ex-con named Fergie and he's like going to his halfway house and he like it goes, it takes him from, because everyone lives in these big mega cities and they're closed off from like this kind of toxic outland. And so he's going from the prison into the mega city and he's like, you know, he's he's like kind of anxious, but he's kind of excited and he's going through the city and he's they're like taking him down and just him driving. You see like, like the Statue of Liberty is there in this mega city There's the big neon lights. It kind of looks like Blade Runner, but it looks like someone took the city from Blade Runner and like squeezed it in a little box. And so like that comes out, like how everything is just pushed together in a way that almost feels uncomfortable, even though you're looking at these giant buildings. And it's like the camera's like, like zooming into like a pool hotel and it comes back out. It's just very impressive For, like, essentially something that they didn't really need to do. They could have just shown you the city and cut to Rob Schneider in his halfway house. 
But the fact that they like take you through the like a tour of the city is super cool, and I really appreciate it that they started the film like that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. They could have done like a just like a what do you call it? like a matte painting background really mm-hmm. quick and then just shot that. But the way they did it all the way going through the sets, the sets are really good actually in this movie. Yeah, the the entire production design, and I think we should add. I don't know. I'm pretty sure everyone knows this, but Judge Dredd is based on a comic book by the same name by 2000 AD. It's a famous um, British comic, so it's I think it's probably their most famous British. I guess John Constantine and everything Alan Moore's done, but still he's also famous. Um, and one of the big, compl- we'll talk about the big complaints later, but yeah, so it starts off and Rob Schneider is like going to this halfway house. And like one of my favorite parts is he sees this hotel and there's like these girls like in a pool and he's like, I think that's the, that's my halfway house. I think that's paradise pines or whatever. And then the, like the driver's like, no, it's not. <laughs> Just keep trying. It's like dream on buddy. Yeah. It's such a good, like, no buddy, you're. You're in Mega City One, and that's not the life you live anymore. <laughs> um, and you know, and I think like, and so he gets to this place, and like he goes to his room, and there's like a gunfight happening between two warring, because everyone again, everyone lives in these big buildings, and so there's two gangs in each, or there's a gang in each building, and they're like shooting at each other from across the skyscrapers, and Rob Schneider's just kind of there, and you know. Rob Schneider is very hit or miss, but I think he's pretty mm-hmm. funny in this movie. There's like the scene yeah. where they're like shooting at each other and then the judges come and Rob Schneider goes, what I'll do is I'll give myself up and then <laughs> you guys can get the drop on him. I think that that's like- Throw him off. Yeah. yeah. And see, that's like, uh, that to me is crazy. It's like, this reminded me. I was like, oh yeah, he is like really good when you use him right. Like, right, right. You know, yeah. like- just in the right role, he's like killing it as the comic relief sidekick in this. And he's yeah. like a little bit slimy because like they're so the judges get there and they like stop everything and Judge Dredd shows that he's a badass. And then he goes up to this machine that's like recycled food and he's telling the machine to like that he has like 10 seconds to comply. And eventually the machine opens and you find Rob Schneider in there because Rob Schneider went to jail for like computer hacking so he can hack any device. Um, and it's a very like... It's very Hollywood hacking where you never actually see him touch a computer, but he just can hack anything he touches. He'll just be holding a wire after and be like, I did it. Yeah. Yeah. But he like tells him like, or he's like, well, my options were to either die. Like Judge Dredd even tells him like your options were you could have jumped out the window. And he's like, if I, if I had jumped out the window, I would have died. He's like, yeah, but you wouldn't have broken the law. And so Judge Dredd like sends him straight back to jail and it kind of like, Already from the first scene, you're seeing these kind of cracks in their system that they've created. Because if you have judges who only see things without like looking at the circumstances, well, then you're going to send this guy who's just trying to survive back to prison on his first day <laughs> without like taking into consideration what he had, why he was doing that. That's and I think like, <laughs> yeah, I think that first scene really like it brings you into the world and it does a really good job of like establishing where everything is. Not just the characters, but also the world in general, you know? Yeah, even the classes, like, literally, all the upper class live higher and the lower class live yeah. lower down the streets. So that was pretty cool. And that's such a funny, like, thing that would make sense, because I would assume that the higher you go, the less pollution you have to deal with. <laughs> yeah. And so, of course, that's where the rich would want right. to live. I think that that's super cool. Um, yeah. And so they also, like, so Judge Dredd works with uh, Judge Hershey, who's played by Diane Lane, and she's, like, a rookie She's also a rookie in um, the in the remake, but they don't give her her psychic powers in this one. And she's also from the comics. And then there's also uh, Max Van Snydon. It's not. It's like sit. Okay, I don't know how to say, it, but I know you're saying. Okay, it. then Max Van <laughs> sit down. He plays Judge Fargo, and it's like one of my favorite. It's like they do something that Vin Diesel likes to do a lot, and like '80s action movies like to do where they take one of the best actors of the previous generation and they just make him like an action guy in the random action movie. <laughs> he, he plays Judge Fargo, who's like the biggest, he's like essentially the president or the mayor of this mega city one. And there's no reason to get one of the best actors of all time to play this role. <laughs> but goddamn, does he not get out of the park? Yeah. 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 He has a line at the beginning, cause they're talking about the city and he, and, um, and that there's just too many people there. And he tell, he has a line where he's like, um, this city continues to grow and growth is painful. 
And I don't have any idea why, but that line has stuck in my head since I've seen the movie. And like, so I'll just be walking around or like if someone, I read, routinely have to sit in on city council meetings for one reason or another. And every time people start talking about anything, like building anything in my head, I'm like, oh, growth is painful for a city. I have no <laughs> idea. I think it's just because he delivers the line so well. Um, <laughs> you should throw that in there at some point. <laughs> just add it. I'm just going to steal it. Um <laughs> And I think overall the entire um, the entire cast is is great. Like Diane Lane does a good job. They don't give her a lot to do, but she still does a good job with what she has. Armand Asante plays Rico, who's Judge Dredd's brother, and he I guess we don't know that yet, but he plays Judge Dredd's brother. <laughs> yeah, he, <laughs> he figure that's out that's that's just yeah. free. Yeah, <laughs> it happens almost immediately. There's a funny <laughs> and like it is kind of funny because Rico, like there, there is a little bit of ham going on with Stallone and Judge Dredd, but there is a whole Memorial Day feast that Rico is feeding on. Every scene with him is so yeah. ridiculously over. But I think it works to like play against each other because like the fact that they're brothers and that they're so different kind of works in their favor. Like there's a so Rico's in jail and he escapes and he's gonna and him and Dredd used to be best friends. They don't know their brothers yet. And so he wants revenge on Dredd because Dredd's the one who sent him to prison. And so he like wants to do it. But there's a scene where he first gets to the city and he's like talking to a weapons dealer. And uh, the weapon's like, oh, I have a package for you. And he shows him the package. And it's a judge's uniform and a gun. And the thing about the judge's gun is it's related to your DNA. So like if, if you can't shoot it unless it's specific to you. And this is part of the comics. It's part of both movies. But um so he grabs it and he's like, uh, and the guy's like, no, don't, don't touch it. You'll, you, you'll get your arm blown off. You have to be a judge. And he grabs it and he goes, guess I'm a judge. And then I he must shoots be a judge. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a cool scene. I know. Like he's so evil. <laughs> he's, he's so like, he's very like, he's, he's going like full throttle. Like, cause the, yeah. you know, judge Dredd is like, I am the law. And he's like, I am chaos. I think he said, right. he, he literally <laughs> says that at one point. I am like, fear. Yeah. yeah. And, and that scene also <laughs> introduces my second favorite thing in the movie, which is he has like a big mech bot. That was mm -hmm. from a previous war and he just like turns it on and it becomes his bodyguard. But again, like that's how cool this is, is that I love when a world is fully formed and like the fact that they allude to wars that have been fought and lost and they use these big mech bots, but that's all you ever know about it. You just know that they had these big machines and they went to war and it's kind of like that makes that to me that makes it even better and the thing looks super cool like all the production it's all we're like talking practical about. effects right yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Look. and he like yeah he looks kind of like an evil version of the iron giant <laughs> yeah a little cool. bit yeah, yeah definitely and cool. so the judge there's like another judge named judge griffin and his name is like jurgen procha i'm not even gonna try it's german as hell um but he has hired rico to kind of blame judge dread so that it's a little complicated, but he wants to blame Judge Dredd. We'll get to the rest of it in a bit. He wants it's, to frame it's, complicated for, yeah. it's complicated for a movie called Judge Dredd. And so like Judge so Rico kills some uh some investigative journalists and they blame Judge Dredd. But I do like that scene because again, Rico bursts in to the to the like reporter's office. The reporter stands up and goes, Dredd, and then they shoot him, and then they do a close-up of the badge and it says Dredd. And it's like, okay, I understand that you're blaming Judge Dredd. I don't think that reporter knew it was Judge Dredd. I think he was going to yell Judge Dredd. Whoever came, he didn't have time to like read that name tag. It's he just fine, assumed. You know. yeah, he just assumed it. It was a judge, but that was it. Yeah. He recognized his jawline or, you know, the fake jawline. They all have that jawline. Even, I, I want to say that they hired Diane Lane because Diane Lane is beautiful, but she also has a very prominent jaw. And like I feel like they did it off. just to give, like, they're like, whoever's in this, we need them to have a judge. Um, and so they put Judge Dredd on trial. And there's another great scene because Judge Hershey is going to be his lawyer. Because you do get a full trial if you're a judge. Yeah, only if and you're so a judge. judge. I thought that was a yeah. nice touch yeah. that they still yeah. get real trials, you know. <laughs> Tribunals, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's like a scene where, uh, oh, no, it's Judge Fargo who goes and talks to Dredd. And Dredd's like, um, and he's like, tell me you didn't do this. And Dredd's like, I didn't. And then Judge Fargo's like, 
I'll have to, I just wanted to look in your eyes. And then it cuts to Stallone and Stallone is like dead face because he's playing Judge Dredd. <laughs> and they've given him blue eyes and he literally looks like the most psychotic person I've ever seen. <laughs> well, he has the Rico eyes at that point. <laughs> I was like, no, oh, this guy did it for sure. <laughs> um, but also, and I do want to talk about that. Stallone, I mean, Stallone is like, they've made jokes about him not being able to act. But I do think that it's not that he doesn't know how to act. It's that his his performance is always very subtle. And then when he kind of like blows it up, it's very loud. And I think people don't like that juxtaposition. But I really like, because he could have played Judge Dredd, even like Carl Urban plays him in the remake, where it's just very gritty and tough. But he kind of plays Judge Dredd as someone who really believes in the law and what they're doing. And so he's, it's not that he's not passionate. It's that he's passionate in a way where he knows that if you're too passionate, you're going to be subverting the law and he doesn't want to do that. And I think that that's, it's a very hard role to play. And I think it does it very well. Yeah. You guys, he combines that stoicism with the, mm-hmm. with that passion. I don't know how he yeah. does that, but. Yeah. It's, and like watching it again and paying yeah. attention to his acting, I was like, Oh shit, he does a really good job in this. Like, and he still has like a bunch of Stallone, like one liners and stuff, but they make sense for his, for his character and so it just kind of yeah. works a lot and they give him a lot more drama than you would think in this movie like again we saw cobra and he i don't think he has a real acting scene in that entire film <laughs> it's been so long <laughs> since i've seen that but I've seen it. <laughs> but this one he really does like there's a scene where he's telling um hershey because she's like oh don't you because he has like a, a speech where he tells him like how lonely being a judge is because you eventually have to like you know, you're always looking out for the law. And so it's it's alienating. And like Judge Hershey's like, well, we have friends and stuff. And she asked him like, oh, did you ever have a friend? And he goes, yeah, I did one time. And she's like, well, what happened? And he goes, I judged him, you know? And But it's like, and even saying that line, it's a silly line, but Stallone like delivers it well. And so it works and you mm-hmm. feel the emotion that he's trying to portray. And so, yeah, I think Stallone did a great job in this one. Yeah, I agree. That was pretty, I, I do like that, uh, court scene because i know he relies on uh hershey to be to defend him right mm-hmm. and yeah. he talks about how brilliant she was at the academy and she was right. the top of her class when it came to to law but when she's in the, when they're actually in the tribunal all she does is just shout and talk about how this is this is a farce but she doesn't yeah. really bring anything that's that makes any she's, it's clever she's a, exactly she's being a movie lawyer we just yell the most and yeah, yeah exactly i, mean, I, I think it's it. yeah I think it's funny because they're like her thing is like because they show the video and she's like this video is grainy we can't use it as evidence <laughs> and then they're like okay that makes sense we won't use it as evidence and then she's like I know you're impressed and I was like that's the most basic I know <laughs> of course you try to get the evidence thrown out if you can that's like the that's lawyering one hundred and one she tries to pass um, it off as something so brilliant same, um, when they're when they're arresting Dread just before they bring him to trial uh, just before they arrest him he's like. Uh, ticketing a, a drunk driver who's oh, dr- yeah. driving the stupidest looking like future sports car i've ever <laughs> seen it's got like two giant like fins on the back and he like tries to bribe him and it's like man that that barely works today and you're gonna try it <laughs> in the future. with the judge that's an executioner too i don't know that's the one time where I'm like, you know, that guy, that guy deserved it. This society's too harsh, but that guy had it. That guy definitely deserved his car to explode. Um, and now, okay, so we kind of skipped over this, but one of the main criticisms that a lot of the fans of the comic book have is in the comic, they never show Judge Dredd's face. And like, if you read the comics, I've, I think I've read like half of them. The cool thing about the comics is that it depends which comic you're reading depends on whether Judge Dredd is a villain or a hero. Because sometimes Judge Dredd will act as like the main hero of the protagonist. Like, you know, when he's fighting Predator, he's clearly just kind of acting as a cop and trying to stop the Predator. But then there's other ones where like, I remember reading one where it was like this girl and it shows her like, she like loses her welfare and she like gets kicked out of school. And then she like starts stealing. And then eventually Judge Dredd's like chasing her. And he's kind of like looked at as this boogeyman. And so issue to issue judge dread's motivations and his role might change but judge dread never changes he just loves the law and whether you're following it kind of depends on what whether you see him as a monster or villain and i think that's a very interesting way to look at it and so him not showing his face in the movie makes sense or in the books makes sense because he's not supposed to be anyone particular 
And one of the big complaints about this is a they show his his face like I think by the second scene he takes off his mask. Yeah. yeah. And also this this book is very related to Judge Dredd. Like it's about Judge Dredd. It's we find out his backstory. We find out Rico's obviously his brother. And so it's very personal to him. He's like trying to get revenge and shit. And I think fans of the comic book were expecting kind of something like the remake where Judge Dredd is very rarely, even when he's the hero of the movie, he's very rarely the center of the movie where like if he's stopping the Predator, like the Predator doesn't care who Judge Dredd is. You know, he just he just yeah. happens to be the best person for the job. And this one, like you couldn't do this with Judge Hershey because it's so related to Judge Dredd. But I think like, I don't know. It didn't really bother me that much how much it focused on Dredd. Did it bother you guys? No, I mean, I think it's like, it's kind of like a conceit of like, I I can almost see, I mean, I I feel like they maybe it could have been like a, like a bigger reveal where it's like, cause you know, he, he gets sentenced and he has to like, he gets exiled Mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, maybe if that were the first time, um, you ever see it with it's off like oh that could be impactful but at the same time you probably want your other like good actors like diane lane and stuff to not just be wearing a giant helmet the whole movie you know right, so right. i kind of like i see it but it's like i understand the conceits of like filmmaking is you know it's it's a little yeah. different i know in the sequel he actually doesn't remove his uh his mm-hmm. helmet at all but that's also like that movie's not really necessarily like same thing it's not really about his like life it's just He's just yeah. the biggest and badass, I, you know. <laughs> I will say that the, the sequel is a lot more in line with the comics. But if you pay attention, like the sequel is Judge Dredd like goes to this one of the big tower blocks and it is run by like a drug dealer and they have a new drug and he's trying to stop it. And you see a lot of the world, but you're only in that tower block the whole time. And I kind of think that if without Judge being able to take off his mask, without the story being kind of about him, you kind of have to do it that way where you're stuck in one location. Um, and so I, I like the conceit of like, yes, we see more of Dread. Yes, it's more about him. But we also get to explore the world a lot more. Like we leave Mega City 1. We go like to like he uh, like once he gets tried, he had, like he's sentenced to prison. And so you see that process. You also see he gets shot down. And so he ends up in the outworld. Stuff that you couldn't really do if you were kind of like, if he's trying to solve a crime, there's really no reason for him to go outside of the city, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I kind of like accepted that conceit. Like I would rather see more of the world, especially now that we have two of them and one does one and one does the other. It's like, yeah, I'll take them both. Um, and Judge Dredd, I mean, Stallone, even when he's when he has a mask, he looks almost identical to Judge Dredd in the comic books. Like he just has the face of Judge Dredd. The, the time, like the know? big body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I never, I never, I've never read the comics. Like all arms and chest and no <laughs> legs whatsoever. The, the, the He-Man <laughs> look. Um, yeah. I didn't know he was like a villain and a hero in the comics, which makes perfect sense, but it's kind of like the, the Godzilla dichotomy, right? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. where, where they change it up. So interesting. Yeah, and the the comic books are a lot more satirical. I mean, this one also kind of, like, again, like Josh was saying, there is a trial, and judges get trials, but the trial is immediately corrupt, because they're like, oh, we have this evidence that we didn't show anyone, let's put it up, and they're (laughs) like, yeah, "Yeah, okay. And then that sentence is judge read, which, like, in the court of law, you can't just present evidence that you haven't shown (laughs) to the opposite side. Um, And But, like, the whole movie, and I think that that's cool about it, is that it shows you why this society won't work where you have like everyone interpreting the law in their own way and kind of being a judge, but it, it doesn't ever like, there's no scene where they stop and tell you, Hey, this isn't going to work. It's just like, they're constantly showing why it won't work. And like, they're showing how corrupt it's already become. And I think that that's like the best way to do it. Like I kind of think of like the purge or when you watch the purge, Every other character's like, yeah, we need to not do this. We need to make this an outlaw. It's like, I know. I know the purge is a bad idea. I live in a world without the purge. You don't have to tell me that. Just show me why it's bad, and then we can go from there. And um, and so I like the way they did it in this one. They're just, it's like a little tweaks of like, this doesn't work really that well. You know, mm-hmm. It might work for the asshole who has a bunch of parking tickets, but it's not going to work for Fergie who's just trying to stay alive in this fucked up place, you know? Yeah, it doesn't try to hit you too much over the head with it. It's just obviously yeah. the practicality of it is not going to work. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they and also so, like, like they because okay. they even kind of do like the villains plan the the evil judge uh, Fargo, 
is like well josh that's perfect because we were gonna expl- i was about to explain what his plan is because if you get talking about it i was like oh it's complicated but now you get to do it <laughs> and explain why it's, he wanted rico he, to do it. he wants to break the super evil anti-judge out of prison to basically commit so much like terrorism that like society's so scared that they let um they let him like pass even like harsher like like law right. like kind of like essentially at the beginning of the movie he's like like the council of judges or whatever and being like oh like clearly arresting everyone for minor offenses isn't working so we should be allowed to execute him for minor offenses too and then <laughs> even the other judges are like no that's too much like you're yeah. you're too caught brained at this point but so he's basically trying to be like well if everyone's scared enough then they then I'll get to, then I'll be allowed to do this and then you know so that's kind of the And the reason that he uses Rico is because he wants Rico to pretend to be Dread because, spoiler alert, they're both clones of a weird super judge program. And so they have the exact same DNA as each other. And so he wants him to be Dread so that he can frame Dread so that at the trial, Dread will go to jail or like the sentence is death. And so this way, he's going to tell Judge Fargo, who's like the dad to Dread, to retire and when you retire you have to go out into the scorched earth but you get one last wish and so he wants him to use his wish to save dread but he doesn't really give a shit about that he just wants him out of there and going to the scorched earth right you know judge fargo won't retire on his own so but he will retire to save judge dread and so that's exactly what happens and I didn't realize how complicated it is. It is very convoluted was. when you say yeah. it like that, yeah. But essentially, I had to describe it, yeah. He, yeah, he falsifies evidence to get his two main like opponents out of the way, which is Max von Sydow and Stallone. And then, by the way, I did I forgot that his name is Joseph Dredd. I wish I just assumed he yeah. just had the name Dredd, but it's like Joe Dredd. What a what an interesting <laughs> idea. Joe Joe Dredd sounds like he should own a surf shop. <laughs> Hang out all day. I do. I do like to do the villain it's is Joey Dread is uh, is named Rico because Rico statutes are like the harshest like law right, enforcement right. thing that can happen. You know, I was like, oh, that's probably like probably a little clever. It's, a, it's also <laughs> funny that his name is Dread because there's a lot of things that are like you have to have mercy on me, Dread, and it's like it's not going to happen. Like, listen to his name. It's bad. <laughs> it's Literally, his name says otherwise. <laughs> yeah, and then well, and so that happens, and it goes into another great sequence again like it's so cool i hate to shit on marvel movies but like the fact that they never go to cool locations like in this movie you have the city you have the statue of liberty that they end up in and then this sequence where they go out into the scorched earth and it's like this weird dead um mad max style planet where everyone's like just trying to survive and there shouldn't be any human beings out there and so they're they're like in the prison ship And that's when Fergie and him reconnect because they're sitting next to each other. And there's like a funny scene where Fergie looks at Dredd and then he covers half of his face to to be like, oh, you're Judge Dredd. I thought that that was an interesting way to do it. Um, And and so these scavengers shoot at the plane and and drop it. And you find out that the scavengers are cannibals. And so they want to stop Dredd. But of course they know Dredd because Dredd kicked them out of the city. And... um, which again, it's like, what were you guys like? I want to, because one of them has like a dial on his head, and half of his skull's missing, and it's replaced by metal, and his whole arm is like a robot arm. It's like, what were you guys doing in the city? We just had like regular jobs. <laughs> and basically, and if your son looks like that, yeah, you they're know. they're like mutant pirate. Well, and that you know, it's funny because you you talk about like um, Marvel, and I think the biggest like issue with a lot of like current like kind of the more recent Marvel movies is. So many of like the fight like type scenes take place on like a desolate beach or something, and they do that because it's yeah. way easier to do CGI in like a nondescript right. yeah. ground, you know, dirt mm-hmm. like dirt and sky. And it's like, well, technically, they go to that kind of location in um, in this movie when like they're shot down and they're like with these like mutant like pirates. But it's like, yeah, but it's all like practical effects and it's on a set. So it still looks really good. Even compared yeah. to that, it's like mm-hmm. even, even the same like dirty kind of barren location. You're like, Oh, they actually put a lot of like heart into this, you know? Yeah. It's, it's or amazing. like they go, they go to like, they take them to a cave that they live in yeah. and you know, it could have just been an easy cave, just put rocks in there, but they have like trinkets that these, this family has collected they have the they found the statue of uh 
of justice with the blindfold on and they've put that as like the centerpiece is like their weird like god kind of thing um and then they have like just a bunch of garbage everywhere because they like live like <laughs> trash and so again like it's just so cool the production design on everything everything just looks really like lived in and really realistic and again like most of it was filmed on sets but you couldn't tell you know mm-hmm. yeah every character there is pretty pretty unique they took their time yeah. to through, like I remember having the toys for that guy with the dial on his head. And I, just, <laughs> right. he was, I thought he was like the coolest looking like villain. Mean, mean yeah. Machine is his name, which is such a like yeah. comic book. Yeah. Mean Machine. And, and then it's so funny because like they, it's so funny. Like you don't realize how many random action movies from the 80s and 90s just threw mutants into their film. Like Total Recall, <laughs> Robocop, this one. Mutants <laughs> were a big deal and they love to do makeup. And I think, again, that's so cool. Like, Again, when you have, like, they can't even put Spider-Man's mask on. It has to be CGI. It's kind of cool to watch this movie where it's like, no, that dial on his head, you can turn it. Like, at one point, (laughs) he's like, because he turns it to get more power or something. It's never really explained. But at one point, Judge 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 turns it off. More cocaine in his blood. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, and it's it's a real thing that works on his head and that turns. And I thought that that was super cool. Um and so, yeah, I don't know if you guys so noticed. There's like a scene where uh, once they get raided by those stormtroopers and that, mm-hmm. and uh, I love how Stallone just has to turn his dial down when he's getting starting to yell. And he's like, "Shut up!" Yeah. <laughs> but right after that, there's like a short shot where you see him that that guy get up and just like slowly start walking to the corner, like he has to go recharge or something. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's pretty. It's good. like a really quick shot, but I hadn't noticed it before. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. And like, because there's a scene where, because they're like, oh, we'll start with Fergie. And Fergie thinks they're going to let him go. And Judge Dredd is like, oh, your friends that you think are like on your side, they're going to cook you. And then like Fergie looks to the fire and like they've walked in and we've seen this fire. Like it's been in the background of the whole scene, but they focus on it. And you realize that there's been like a human carcass, like rotating like right. a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, like every inch of this like little cave that they made has been thought about like what would they do here what would they do here and i think it's just so well done it's super cool and again that scene didn't even nearly need to be in the movie because they immediately murdered that whole family and then they just kind of go about their way <laughs> and so <laughs> that's when judge fargo comes back and he like says oh i'm still out here but then they murder him and so judge dread is like going for revenge and that kind of leads to judge dread coming back to the mega city for revenge and it like the movie's pacing, it's only an hour and a half, which is great. Mm-hmm. But the movie's pacing, yeah. it doesn't let up. It's like it goes doesn't. and goes. And I think it's great, yeah. Yeah. And it's even just getting cool. back into the city, that whole scene with the that fire tunnel. Oh, yeah, the yeah. fire tunnel, yeah. Even yeah. that was pretty fun. With Rob Schneider. Yeah. It's, it's a good one, yeah. And again, not to shit on Marvel too much. I'll shit on DC for a second. There's like that scene where Batman like comes back to Gotham and just shows him back in the city. And this movie could have easily done that, but they the fact that they made like a random action sequence where there's like, because they have to go through the turbines and then there's like fire that shoots out like exhaust every, I think it's 90 seconds. So as soon as it hits, they just take off running and hope for the best. And they don't, I don't know if you guys noticed this, they wouldn't have made it. There just happens to be a hole right, that I guess someone like else had done. And then like yeah. jump in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so I think that that's such an interesting idea that if they had tried to do it, they weren't going to make it at all. It just Judge Red realizes this and makes a hole. I thought that was an interesting touch. You know? It also helps them like build their rapport and trust together. Mm-hmm. Without that, I don't think you would have been like, why is you know why is Bridge still want Fergie following him around and being you know making right. fun of him all day? But <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good little team. He like asked to apologize. He's like, I've never apologized. I'm the law. It's like, you're not the yeah. law anymore. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's a nice character moment. Yeah. And there, there's a really cool scene where right after they escape and they jump into the city, cause they land on a bunch of garbage. Fergie, like he likes touching his body. He's like, Oh, I'm alive. And then like judge Dredd stands <laughs> up. He goes, Oh, so are you. <laughs> That's a funny line. <laughs> But yeah, and th- then they get back to the city, and then it's it's a one off between Riku and Judge Dredd. But we won't ruin that part. Although I assume you'll probably figure out who comes out on top. But I think it's also like 
Can we say, though, it's so funny that they give Rico an evil girlfriend so Diane Lane can also have, a, like, a quick fight <laughs> scene. So, like, she's like, yeah. yeah exactly, just for that reason for the, Diane Lane. The classic yeah. comic book women kicking at each other fight, you know? Yeah. You, can't, you can't have women fighting men. They have to fight each other. Well, and it's funny because her role, because she's played by jo- Joan Chen, and her role is supposed, like, they're, the whole point is that they want to make more judges, like clone judges. And her role is like the genetic scientist who's like in charge of the clones. There is absolutely no reason why she should be in a skin tight jumpsuit and also no karate. Right, doing like they karate like, moves. Yeah. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're gonna do it. <laughs> and um, and yeah, I think like she does a great job. Like they add, they introduce some clones. That, that's my only thing. Is they introduce clones, and the clones look like Frankenstein monsters because they're not ready to develop yet. And like Rico's like, get them out here. But they never actually come out. They like stay in the test tube. Yeah. And you see them like start to wake up. But I just think it would have been cool if there was just a scene where Judge Dredd has to fuck up a bunch of like random monsters. Like, like 20 clones. Play. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently they did. I read that that they had a really? scene about that, but they deleted it when they were trying to get it down to from that R rating or, or a NC 17 oh, rating or something. That makes sense. And see, I think like and that makes a lot of sense because like. There's a lot of buildup for those clones just yeah. for nothing to kind of happen. Like, you see their yeah. hand hit the thing, mm-hmm. and they look super cool. Like, I was always disappointed because if they just look like Judge Dredd, I wouldn't care that much. But they have, they're like green and they yeah. have like no mouth, but they have like really bright eyes and they don't have eyelids. So they just look terrifying. And I really wanted Judge Dredd to have to murder all of them. Um, <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, I think overall, I think this movie. It's super well done. I think like it's a lot of fun. It's kind of like how I like action films where there's like there's some like you you don't have to think about how corrupt the system would be, but you can if you want to. But if you just want to watch Stallone fuck shit up for two hours, you can also do that. Um, I think the cast is great. I think the cast is probably the standout. Well, the cast, everything really. The production design is great. The music is cool. Um and it also ends with Judge Dredd like just pulling up to like he has like a Batman moment where he like pulls mm-hmm. up on his Mega City bike, um, and he's just like looking out at the city. I thought that was cool. But yeah, I think overall it's it's a great film. What about you guys? Any last thoughts on Judge Dredd? Yeah, it's a fun movie. That's uh, I I did forget how fast paced it was, but it just flies through. There's never any point where you're like getting bored or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, any yeah. almost every comic book movie should be under 100 minutes and this movie delivers on that and i i also feel like it is one of those where you would so expect the 2012 one to be the political one because of you know that's kind of everything's more political now but it's like no that's the political ones the 95 one so it's almost more interesting mm-hmm. to be like oh they were really like going for like all like the lo- yeah. like like legal satire so it's pretty mm-hmm. it's pretty good pretty smart pretty pretty yeah. well acted yeah and also, I would recommend the twenty, the other one. Oh, yeah, that one's it's, great it's too. Cool. Yeah, I'm just saying it's it, that's more it's straightforward. Different. It's like the raid in the yeah. future. Like it's just, mm-hmm. which is great. Obviously, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it's a good action movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, they're both good. I would recommend both of them. Um, and yeah, Danny, do you, where can people find you? Um, well, you can find me on uh, on Instagram. Um, I do, uh, even though we don't really play together anymore, um, the band that I created most of my music with was uh, Le Voyage. You can look us up on Le Voyage Music on uh, Instagram, Facebook, basically all platforms. Uh, we also have our music on Spotify. Um, really proud of what, what I did with that uh, band. So you can that's uh, probably the main thing you can check out for me. Well, and I'll include those links at the bottom just so you guys can check them out. I would highly recommend checking out their music. They have some videos. Um, check those out too. Uh, and yeah, Spotify, always go check them out. And also check out The Empty Space. His music is in that as well. Um, but yeah, thanks, Danny, for joining us. This was super fun. I always like when we get to pick movies. that it, I kind of feel like this movie reminds me a little bit of True Lies for Arnold. It's like his True Lies where... You yeah. kind of forget that it's great. And then you watch it and you're like, oh, yeah, this movie rocks. Yeah. You know? And, it, and it's only because Stallone and Arnold have a plethora of iconic movies that they're just in. Yeah. And so, like, once you're watching Rambo and Rocky, you're like, oh, yeah, he also does Judge Shred, and it's super great. And so I think that that's cool. And I feel like we've done – Josh, how much Stallone have we done? This is our oh, yeah, third we did. one? 
You know, co- yeah, Cobra, Copland. Uh, oh, I feel like there's there's one more. Um, not Demolition Man. Probably not going to do no. Demolition Man. We might. But I, well, and I think like Stallone is almost the perfect person for this podcast because I feel like people don't take him that seriously. And it, like if you watch, if you watch the original preview for Rocky, um, the whole thing is like Sylvester Stallone has been compared to Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Sylvester Stallone, the next great acting talent of our generation. And like the whole preview is like focused on Stallone's acting. And so, and he hasn't really changed. It's just, he like, he kind of got caught up in the whole action movie stuff. And like, Mm -hmm. I will say that he did have action movies that were dumber than our Schwarzenegger. But you know, he also had a lot of gems like this one that really showcased what he could do. Copland also. But he's a great actor when he has the right material, and I think he does a great job in this. So check out this one. Check out the original Dread. But who cares about those movies? Check out The Empty Space. It's right there. It's a poster. Go watch it. Go buy it. Break. It. Tell your grandma you're going to borrow her credit card and buy it off of that. Don't buy groceries. Just go buy 15 copies. And we will... I don't even think we see the money, but someone will see that money. <laughs> it will hopefully go. You will get a check for seven dollars in three months. Yeah. <laughs> I get a check for fifty cents every hundred units sold. So just go check it out. But we worked really hard on that movie. It's out now. Um, if you want to even t- taste, take a little taste of Danny's um, music, you'll just you've heard it already in the trailer to this um, to this podcast of the at the beginning. So. Check it out. It's super cool. We love the movie. Um, And we'll see you guys next time on The Bone Squad.